Welcome to worship. I am so glad that you have chosen to join with us today as you have gathered in your homes or wherever you are watching from. I hope that you have created a sacred space. Um, if you have candles, let's go ahead and light the candles. We do this each and every week as a reminder of God's constant and abiding presence in our lives. We also pour the waters to remind us of God's claim on our lives, to know that God looks upon us every single moment and says, you are mine. You are holy, you are sacred, you are valued, you are worthy, you are God's beloved child. And it is out of that deep love that God has for us that we come together seeking to know this God who loves us. And then we're invited to live out that love everywhere we go. We do indeed serve an incredible God. A couple of things to share with you. Hopefully, you received a copy of our special edition in the mail. If you've not received one, send us an email. Or when you're filling out the connection card online through the link that's either on your YouTube page or the email or Facebook, let us know that you need a copy of this. This is full of all kinds of information of things that will be coming up, different events that you can participate in. For example, starting this week, on Tuesday morning at 9, we have a Zoom coffee hour. Uh, and then on Wednesday at 5.30, we have a Zoom happy hour. There's other events that will be starting. This past week, we started a conversation on race, and I'm going to stop right there and say I'm sorry. We had a lot of technical difficulties, and we had some challenges. Uh, but we are working diligently and hope that you will join us again. Information is in this newsletter as well as in the e-news that you receive. There are so many things that are going on that, that you can indeed connect with us and others in our church to be a part of. And I hope you'll take the time to register for those and participate in them. But we have gathered to worship. And so I invite you to simply take a moment and breathe. And open yourself to the God who loves you so much. The God who is indeed present with us as we move into this time of worship. Will you please join us in our call to worship? God has abundantly cast God's seeds of love and hope upon us. May, May we, we be fruitful soil for the, the planting and growing of hope and peace. Come, let us praise God who is so generous with us. Let, Let us sing songs of joy to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us join in one voice as we sing our opening song. All for you.
welcome to children's moment. I'm glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. I need some help. What is all of this? I'm still working on my garden. Oh yeah, how's that going? Has anything sprouted? Sprouted, sprouted. I don't even have the seeds in the ground. Ooh, you don't have the seeds in the ground. Isn't it a little late to start planting a fall garden? Yes, probably, maybe, I don't know. I keep, I can't decide where I should plant which vegetables and what time of day I should water. And what if a rabbit gets under the fence or a bird flies in or bugs? Always okay. the chance of bugs. All right, calm down. You know, those things happen sometimes, but all we really need is some bread, some water, and today's scripture. Um, are we going to give up the garden and learn to fish? No, today's scripture is from Ecclesiastes 11. It says, send out your bread upon the waters, and after many days, you will get it back. Okay, so I'm going to throw some bread into the water and get it back. And then what? This soggy bread looks about as edible as my ungrown vegetables. That is true. Luckily, there's more to our scripture. It also says something about when clouds are full, it will rain. When a tree falls, it will lie there. If you watch the wind, you will never plant anything. And that none of us know the work of God who makes everything. Okay, um, that's super helpful. Thanks so much. I think I've got everything I need. I'm just gonna be going. Wait a minute. No, no, remember, sometimes scripture can be a little bit tricky but this passage is actually full of very helpful advice. Okay, all right, I'll trust you on this. Uh, can we go back to that bread and water part? <laughs> yes, that's a way of reminding us to give generously from what we receive from God and share those gifts. Okay, so saying the bread will come back is like when we share and give generously, it always seems to come back to us too. Yes. All right, but that next part about full clouds and fallen trees lying there seems kind of obvious. Yes, there are some things that we know for sure in the world, and we can use those certainties to help us make our decisions and calculate our risks. Hmm, interesting. Okay, then we get to the gardening part. Something about whoever watches the wind will not sow. Yeah, sometimes we think that everything has to be absolutely perfect before we do anything. Try a new sport, start painting, plant a garden. But nothing is ever perfect, and if we wait and wait for the exactly perfect situation, we will never get going at all. Jump in, take a chance, plant a seed, and see what happens. Ooh, that is helpful advice. Well, I was worried about what seeds to put where and bunnies and birds. I stopped working and planting, and that's a sure way to grow absolutely nothing. I'd have a way better chance if I tried, even if not everything is perfect. Right, none of us know the work of God who makes everything. We have to take risks every day, getting in a car, talking to a new friend, turning in an assignment for school, or swinging out a pitch. So many risks we take. But we use what we know to make wise risks, and we don't stop working and giving and trying and sharing. We aren't in charge of the results God is. We are in charge of being faithful with what God has given us, and the rest is up to God. So this is exactly the advice I needed. I'm going to plant my seeds and work in my garden and see what happens. Excellent. Oh, and share generously. Here you go. Oh, let's pray. Loving God. Loving God. We know for sure. We know for sure. You love us so much. You love us so much. You are always at work in us. You are always at work in us. Help us take wise risks. Help us take wise risks. And share your gifts. And share your gifts. Amen. Amen. As we come to this time of uh, pastoral prayer, I want to remind you that First United Methodist Church Georgetown is a praying congregation. We believe in the power of prayer. Each week, the discipleship team joins together 
And we pray for those who have submitted their prayer concerns as well as their joys. And we invite you to send your prayer concerns and joys to us at pray at fumcgt.org. And we will certainly include those in our prayers during the week. Will you join me now as we enter into this time of prayer? Using the words of Father Richard Rohr as we begin. O oh, great love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and all beings. Help us to become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens as well as the weight of glory. Listen to our heart's longing for the healing of our world. Oh God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you move in our lives to show us your faithfulness, feeding us, clothing us, sheltering us and healing us, consoling us and forgiving us. We thank you for your patience with us as we live and share our concerns. Today we especially lift up the leaders of our nation to your loving care. We also continue to lift our school children and teachers and staff and their families. We pray for the protection of our health care workers and our first responders and all who are attending to our emergency and essential needs. We lift up our neighbors all across this nation, those on the West Coast enduring the horrific fires as well as those in the South and on the East Coast who are experiencing hurricanes and storms. There's so much for which we are grateful, and yet there's so much that we have as matters of concern. We know that you are hearing us better than we are speaking. And so we offer these prayers in the holy name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us to pray using these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
join me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Send out your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will get it back. Divide your means seven ways, or even eight, for you do not know what disaster may happen on earth. When clouds are full, they empty rain on the earth, whether a tree falls to the south or to the north. In the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. Whoever observes the wind will not sow, and whoever regards the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know how the breath comes to the bones in the mother's womb, so you do not know the work of God, who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening, do not let your hands be idle. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So for the past few weeks, we've been looking at growing hope using the metaphor of a garden. We've gone from imagining the possibilities to preparing for what we will plant. This week, we'll consider putting into place those plants or ideas for the kind of future that we have begun to imagine. Now granted, anyone who has planted a garden, whether it's flowering or a vegetable garden, knows that even when you purchase a plant and it looks exactly like what you imagine, it may or may not grow to become all that you had hoped for. If, for example, you purchased and planted pink hydrangeas, you may be surprised to find them blooming blue if your pH levels of your soil drops too low. Either way, you have these beautiful flowering globes, but maybe not in the color you were looking for. The good news, for most varieties of hydrangeas anyway, is that you can amend the pH level of the soil to get what you imagine. But not everything we plant or plan and prepare for can be so easily managed, as many of us have likely discovered in our own lives. It helps to have the ability to be flexible, to kind of roll with things or accept when things emerge differently. Our Israelite ancestors struggled as we do with the challenges of life in relation to their faith in God. In the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew canon is divided into three main sections. We have the Torah or the law, we have the section with the prophets, and then we have what they call the writings. And within each of these are subsections. So in the writing sections, for example, we have the works of the scribes, such as Ezra and Nehemiah. We have a historical work, such as the books of Chronicles. We also have the book of Psalms and the short stories of Ruth and Esther, the poetry of the Song of Solomon, and then the wisdom books, Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. Our reading today from Ecclesiastes is best considered practical wisdom from a human perspective. It is a unique book in that it is about ideas rather than a book focused on God. As one scholar noted, its ideas are about human survival in the world in which work is pain, overwork is foolish, pleasure soon pales in the face of death, and wisdom is unable to comprehend even the simplest sequences that would make possible real understanding of the world. Our ancient ancestors were no less interested in understanding cause and effect than we are today. When terrible things happen, the primary consideration was that somehow that person or that group of people or that nation 
had done something to upset God. Even in modern times, we have a tendency to simply imagine difficult circumstances as somehow being brought about by God, possibly as a consequence. Often, we cannot fully comprehend what may have led to such consequences, and we're simply baffled by what has happened. The pandemic, for example. All of a sudden, it seemed a new and dangerous virus had emerged, one that spread from Wuhan, China, across the entire world. Why? You know, as educated and enlightened people, we have come to believe that we can answer such questions, that we can know fully and understand. And yet, we don't. We still encounter circumstances that we cannot fully comprehend. The wisdom expressed in the book of Ecclesiastes recognizes this conundrum of comprehensibility. The author of the book is named only by title, Kohelet. The Hebrew word derives from the word for assemble, suggesting that this person was one who led assemblies. The Hebrew, later translated into Greek, becomes Ecclesiastes, or one who leads a congregation. So he could have been a preacher or perhaps a teacher. Given the lessons that are found in the book and the fact that the author is not offering a solid theological understanding of who God is, it makes sense to simply see him as the teacher. It isn't an easy book. Grasping the concepts takes some thought and consideration of the language used. The author uses key words and phrases repeatedly to express his point. One such word is the Hebrew word hebel, used 38 times in the 12 chapters of this book. Now, we've often seen that word translated as vanity, or sometimes as emptiness, futility, meaninglessness, or even absurd. While summarizing the point of the book certainly runs the risk of oversimplifying the message, we do begin to see a point that many of us would rather dismiss. Life can be absurd. Now hang with me here. This is not nearly as depressing as it may sound right now. But we do need to dig a little deeper and consider this perspective. In general, the author, the teacher, is reflecting on human behavior, the behavior of living beings, and divine behavior. He watches and observes, much like an anthropologist. What he sees is that human labor produces goods and achievement, and yet all avails for nothing in the face of chance and death. It is possible to find pleasure, wisdom, and the like and yet they do not guarantee happiness or long life. Even the behavior that according to the normal piety of ancient Israel and of many people today ought to be rewarded by God appears instead to be punished. The system of reward and punishment is out of order. In all of these things, a disparity exists between what people expect and what actually happens to them. Again, hang in there with me. There is cause for hope. Somewhere between believing we are in complete control of our lives and surrendering to simply being tossed about by whatever happens, we find that, yes, God is in control and has ordered life, and, yes, we do have the ability to make decisions to shape our near future and to behave either foolishly or responsibly. We know we can't anticipate every eventuality. We prepare to the best of our ability, but there are things we just cannot know in advance. Earlier this year, one of our church members, Jan Goad, was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a blood cancer that impacts the healthy cells in our bones. While there's not a cure for this kind of cancer, it is possible for it to be put in remission following several different treatments, including a stem cell transplant. 
Jan was admitted to the hospital on August 31st for the transplant after completing several months of chemotherapy. He was released on Tuesday of this past week and he shared the following with us. He says, we went into the stem cell transplant procedure with our eyes open, knowing intellectually what would happen to me. Knowing and experiencing are, however, two different things. An analogy came to me as I was leaving the hospital. When you use MapQuest to map out a trip, you can see on paper the route to take. It shows you the roads, the turns, the towns, the directions. Despite all the turns, intersections, stops, and speed limits, it is a very straightforward, simple thing to follow. You feel as though you know what to expect along the way. What the map does not show you is the traffic, the weather conditions, the unexpected construction, the accidents, the cone zones, the detours, the crazy drivers, the gasoline stops, and the stops for a sore butt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The reality of the trip is far from the superficial view of the trip on a map plan. Still, even after all that, he says, I'm glad that it was done. I'm even more glad that it is over. Jan gave me permission to share this with you. I know you will join me in continuing to hold Jan and his wife, Jean, in prayer as he recovers and pray for remission from his cancer. You know, we plan and prepare for our lives even knowing that there will be circumstances or events we did not plan for. We also know that God continues to work in our world and in us to create the kind of world that God imagines. There are times when we plan and prepare and then find ourselves choosing differently, perhaps feeling the nudge of God's spirit to shift direction or take a detour. God gives us space to make choices, to behave at our discretion, and to imagine the course of our own lives. All of this is the gift of free will that each of us has been given. And yet, at the same time, we operate within God's activity. I've mentioned before that we simply did not imagine we would be in these circumstances when we shifted all of our worship online back in March as the pandemic erupted. After we sheltered in place, hunkering down for the storm to pass, we've come to realize this isn't just a short-term experience. And we mourn that it has forced us to change our lives so dramatically in ways that we could not plan and prepare for. I've also shared that there have been some good things that have happened. We've learned new ways of connecting. Many of you have now mastered the muting and unmuting of your microphones on Zoom calls. After, of course, you learned how to download the application, log on, and successfully connect. We've discovered that drive-by birthday par parades can be uplifting and that FaceTime is a great way to see our friends and family when we can't get together in person. And we admit that none of these things feel good as a long-term or permanent solution, but they do exemplify our ability to adapt and get creative. I celebrate that even as I recognize how difficult this time is for all of us. The teacher, Kohelet, witnessed the struggle of being human, the desire to enjoy life while also coping with the unexpected challenges that are also a part of life. In our passage today, he imparts great wisdom in reminding us to keep doing our part. He starts out by saying, send out your bread upon the waters. In other words, be generous. Give of what you have that others may also receive. He goes on to say, divide your means seven ways or even eight. For you have no idea what unexpected circumstances may occur. In other words, diversify your investments of time, talent, and treasure so that you can be nimble and adapt when circumstances change. He mentions that the rain and the tree that falls are not things that you and I can control. 
but simply watching the weather and paying attention to the clouds without planting will not produce a harvest. And then finally, he says to us, just as you do not know how the breath comes to the bones in your mother's womb, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and at evening, do not let your hands be idle, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. We will never know all there is to know about God or how the world works or why various things happen. But our faith urges us to place our hope in God's unconditional love for us, freeing us to choose how we respond. There is great joy in living fully into the freedom God gives us. So long as we don't fool ourselves into thinking we have the same ability to control our lives that God has in the world. You know, in the Gospels, we hear Jesus asking the question, why do you worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear? For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. He points out that the birds don't sow or reap, nor do they have storehouses or barns for food, and yet God provides for them. How much more, he asks, will God provide for you, who is of much more value to God than the birds? We plant what we have imagined will be a beautiful garden. We plan and prepare for what we imagine will be a fulfilling and joy-filled life. Even if the pink flowers turn blue, there will still be beauty. Even when the unexpected happens, we will face it and deal with it. Now, maybe that sounds absurd. Or maybe wringing our hands because we cannot accept our limitations is what is truly absurd. Perhaps we would do well to simply remember that we are not alone. God is and always will be with us. That much I know is true. Amen. Join with me as we affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who is created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're grateful that you have been part of this worship service, and uh, now is the time when we, we ask you to continue to support uh, the mission and ministries here at the First United Methodist Church of Georgetown. Uh, you can do that in several ways. Uh, you can send a check directly to us at our church address, 410 uh, East University at Georgetown, Texas, uh, or you can uh, go to our website, uh, go to fumcgt.org uh, slash give. Um, and there's also a way to text to give. Uh, all of those ways are on your screen. Uh, please realize how grateful we are uh, for the ways that you give and for the ways that you support 
uh, what we do uh, in these uh, d- difficult and unique times. Uh, God is calling us to do some, some wonderful things, uh, and it is your gifts that are enabling us to be in those places that God is calling us to be. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, thank you for all the ways that you continue to bless us. Receive now these gifts which we will be collecting. We offer them back to you and pray that you would multiply them and scatter them, that they might be signs of your love and our love throughout the world. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to let you know that uh, we will now be blessed by a special virtual anthem by our Chancellor Choir uh, down by the riverside. Please join us in our closing hymn, You Are the Seed.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I'm not sure what your plans are for the rest of the day. Perhaps you've got lunch plans or dinner plans. Perhaps you've got a delivery coming in or you are planning to go to the grocery store somewhere. I'm not sure exactly what your plans are. And everything may work exactly the way you imagined it. Or it may not. Either way, take comfort in knowing that no matter what happens, you're not alone. God, who loves you, is always with you. Go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.